Well, good morning. Welcome to our morning worship celebration at Evergreen Baptist Church. I'm Mark Whittington, the pastor, and I want to welcome you, especially for those of you worshiping with us online today. Thank you so much for joining us uh, and for taking the time, even from a distance, to worship with us, to celebrate uh, the, the faith and the trust that we can place in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and know that it is never misplaced. That's going to kind of be our focus today, uh, focusing on faith instead of fear. Uh, but thank you. Thank you so much for being uh, with us today. I uh, would love to know that you're with us, uh, and you can do that uh, very quickly and easily through our Connect page at ebcinchrist.org connect. You can fill that out and send that to us, and uh, we can have a record, uh, not just a record of your, of your worship time and your visit with us, but also the opportunity to have a conversation with you about uh, prayer requests or questions that you might have. Uh, you can also give through our website as well, ebcinchrist.org slash give. You can give online, and uh, not only for our regular uh, offerings, but special offerings that you might want to participate in as well. Many of you have done that uh, through our, our Christmas offering and our World Hunger offering, and coming very soon will be our Annie Armstrong Easter offering for North American Mission. So you be on the lookout for that as we uh, will be focusing on that very soon. Uh, one other thing I want to remind you of, some of you I'm sure have been a part of this as springtime gets really close. Uh, our youth, one of their uh, two major fundraisers during the year, uh, one of those is in the springtime where they sell ferns. They'll be selling Boston ferns and Kimberly Queen ferns through the month of February. So if you would like to uh, get some of those to help spruce up your place for springtime, uh, you get in touch with us. Or if you know some of our youth personally, uh, I know they would appreciate you coming to them directly and asking them about that. But if not, you can call our church office and we can get you on a list for those as well but so many things going on and we are excited to be together today to worship and to be reminded of how important it is to live by faith in every way in every part and in every circumstance of our lives so we're going to sing about that and we're going to study God's word uh, in a little while and focus in on that but right now I would love for you to join me in prayer and as we pray we ask God to uh, open our eyes and our hearts and our minds to his word and the filling and the, and the speaking and the leading of his Holy Spirit today let's pray together Father, I thank you so much for the joy that we have to gather together, to worship together, to sing together, to, to give together, to pray together, to study your word together, all of this for your glory, all of this to draw near to you, to the throne of our creator, almighty God. And I thank you for making that possible uh, through Jesus Christ. Only because of his perfect sacrifice are we able to come into your presence. Just, uh, just uh, like the priest uh, in the days of Moses was only able to come into your presence through the sacrificial lamb on behalf of all of the people now. Because of Jesus Christ, you have opened the way and you have made the perfect sacrifice for us to come into your presence and to worship and to give thanks and to come confessing our sin and acknowledging your holiness and your majesty. And we do that all together today. And I thank you for this time and for each one here in this place, for those that may be watching, those that are gathering with us perhaps from a great distance, I thank you for each one knowing that it's not an accident, it's not a coincidence that we are gathered together today to focus uh, especially on the importance of, of faith completely, uh, no strings attached, placed in you. So help us to do that today, Lord, in every circumstances. For as we are gathered here, uh, we are gathered here from uh, many different places, many different situations, many circumstances, so many different needs. But yet you are God, you are sovereign, you are, you are aware, and you are involved and in control of each and every one. And I thank you for that today. And I pray that our, our lives would be drawn um, so much closer to you but then also closer to each other and closer to those that we meet along the way, realizing uh, that you are not only the hope for this hour, you're not, you not only the hope for us, but you are the hope for all the world. And I pray that would be the burden of our hearts, to take this hope, to take the life that we have in Jesus Christ to all those that we meet along the way. So again, Lord, I thank you for this time, and I thank you for the way 
Uh, you meet here with us as we worship, as we gather together in Jesus' name. And it's in his name we pray and we celebrate and we worship today. Amen. Amen. Well, let's sing together this morning about placing our faith completely in the Lord Jesus Christ. My faith has found a resting place. And then that beautiful little chorus, God will make a way. Continue to sing, trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Let's sing it all together this morning. Oh 
but to trust and obey. All right, let's take God's Word in our hands and open it up to Exodus chapter 3. Hope you've got your copy of the Bible right there, Exodus chapter 3, and then into Exodus chapter 4. It's where we will be this morning, continuing our walk with God in the wilderness, our study in the book of Exodus. Today, focusing on faith, or are we focusing on fear? Asking this question, do I really trust God? Faith or fear? Do I really trust? trust God. But let me ask a few more questions to kind of set our focus for the morning. What does it take for us to be convinced that God is in control? What does it take for us to be convinced that God is in control? How much does God have to do before we believe he can handle any situation? How much does he have, what does he have to do to prove that he can handle any situation. How long will it be before we say, yes, Lord, or like the prophet Isaiah, here am I, send me, when God speaks to our hearts? How long will it be before we truly surrender all? How easy it is to make excuses Oh, how easy it is. The Kingsman Quartet, if you're Southern Gospel lovers, you recognize the name, the Kingsman Quartet. Many years ago, they sang a song entitled, Excuses. And I looked up the lyrics because I knew just bits and pieces because I had heard them along the way. And the focus of the song is primarily aiming at those who seem to always make excuses for not coming to church. Now, that really seems to be appropriate, perhaps, in the post-COVID pandemic or semi-post-COVID pandemic or whatever you want to call it that we are living in today. But it was, it was humorous but heartbreaking at the same time to read these lyrics written many years ago, but perhaps rather applicable today. The chorus goes, excuses, excuses. You hear them every day. And the devil, he'll supply them if the church, you stay away. When people come to know the Lord, the devil always loses. So to keep them folks away from church, he offers them excuses. And here's some of the excuses. In the summer, it's too hot. And in the winter, it's too cold. In the springtime, when the weather's just right, you find someplace else to go. Well, it's up to the mountains or down to the beach or to visit some old friend or to just stay home and kind of relax and hope that some of the kinfolk will start dropping in. Well, the church benches are too hard, and that choir sings way too loud. Boy, you know how nervous you get when you're sitting in a great big crowd. The doctor told you, now you better watch them crowds. They'll set you back. But you go to that old ball game because you say it helps you to relax. Well... A headache Sunday morning and a backache Sunday night. But by work time Monday morning, you're feeling quite all right. While one of the children has a cold, pneumonia, do you suppose? Why, the whole family had to stay home just to blow that poor kid's nose. (laughs) Excuses, excuses. You hear them every day. And the devil, he'll supply them if the church, you stay away. When people come to know the Lord, the devil always loses. So to keep them folks away from church, he offers them excuses. Well, the preacher, he's too young, and maybe he's too old. The sermons, they're not hard enough, and maybe they're too bold. His voice is much too quiet-like. Sometimes he gets too loud. He needs to have more dignity, or else he's way too proud. Well, the sermons, they're too long, and well, maybe they're too short. He ought to preach the word with dignity instead of stomp and snort. Well, that preacher we've got must be the world's most stuck-up man. One day the ladies told me the other day that he didn't even shake my hand. Excuses, excuses. You hear them every day, and the devil, he'll supply them. I would imagine no matter where you are today, when people come to know the Lord, the devil always loses. So to keep folks, well, just from being very effective, he offers them excuses. Mm. Faith or fear, do I really 
trust in God. Well, we meet Moses here again in Exodus chapter 3 in the end of chapter 4. Moses uh, had, had met with God personally. God had come to Moses personally through a miraculous manifestation. We talked about it last week, that burning bush on the backside of the desert that didn't burn up. Not only did God come to Moses, but God spoke to him. I mean, God could have just put on a light show, and that would have been enough. But God spoke to Moses personally with great comfort about the plight of the Hebrew people. Not only did God prove to Moses that he knew where Moses was, but he he reminded Moses that he knew where his people were. He knew where the nation of Israel was. Was And then God commissioned Moses personally to go and be the agent of deliverance in the hand of God before Pharaoh. All of this very personally to Moses. But it seems even after 40 years of Moses, knowing who he was, knowing where he had come from, and knowing that even his own life was a miracle, he still had questions and doubts and, yes, even excuses demonstrating that That ultimately his fear was was taking over, was often controlling his faith. And I don't know about you, but when I read a story like this, I find myself very much often in this picture, in a place where my fear rises up and shines or or shadows, rather, a, a dark cloud on my faith that should be strong, that should by now be convinced that God can make a way, even as we sang a moment ago, where there seems to be no way. It's a place we can all identify with, and it's a place even where God meets us, just like God met Moses. I'm so glad, aren't you, that God still meets us in this place of doubt and despair. And Moses is not the only example. We see so many examples of that through the Scripture, including Jesus challenging his own disciples face to face. But this is a place where we must move beyond if we are going to truly be surrendered servants of God. We must move out of fear and into faith, really trusting God. So when we, when we continue this journey now with Moses, we see some questions that he asked that perhaps you can identify with this morning. So let's just walk through these questions, beginning in verse 10 where we ended last week. The first question that we see Moses asking could basically be summed up like this. Who am I? Who am I? Look at verse 10 and 11 of Exodus chapter 3. God speaking and says, therefore, come now, And I will send you to Pharaoh so that you may bring my people, the sons of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the sons of Israel out of Egypt? Who am I? Well, Moses was right. Moses was right to question his own abilities and his own qualifications. Moses didn't have the abilities. Moses didn't have the qualifications. But God did. This was definitely something that he could not do alone. Remember what we've already said? When God calls you, when God calls me, it's going to be to do something that only he can do. If it was something that only we could do, if it was something that we could do on our own, then God would not be honored. God would not be glorified because you know the way you're bent. I know the way I'm bent. If it's something that I can do, what am I going to do? Look at me. Didn't I do such a great job? And again, through the example of Scripture and just history itself, that typically doesn't end well. Just ask Nebuchadnezzar how that goes. But as we hear the questions, even though this was a, this was a fair question, we might could say, but even as we hear the questions and even see the excuses We also learn that Moses was still focused more on his inability than he was on God's ability. And that is not the place of faith. That is the place of fear. When I am more concerned or or more focused on my inability versus God's ability, then I'm living in fear. I'm living in fear. And you know what fear does? Fear does a lot of things, but one thing fear really makes the child of God do, fear makes us forget. 
fear makes us forget. We forget so many things, not the least of which are the promises of God again and again and again. We forget promises like Psalm 139 verse 14 where the psalmist says, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Living in fear, we, we forget promises like that. We forget promises like we find in Jeremiah chapter 31 verse 3 which reminds me that we are loved with an everlasting love. Oh, that's a good one. Or perhaps the promise that Jesus makes in Matthew chapter 10, verse 30. You know how much God knows you? You know how personal God is? Even the hairs of your head are numbered. That's how much God knows about you. That's how in tune and in touch he is with where you are and what's going on. Perhaps one of the most well-known promises, but maybe not so often claimed promises of Jesus that he makes in Matthew chapter 28, verse 20, when he said, I am with you always. That's a promise. But you know what fear does? Fear makes us forget those promises. Promises, like Paul writes about in his letters, like 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, when God says, my grace is sufficient. Sufficient. My grace is enough for you. And I don't know about you, but when I begin that slippery slide into fear, all of these promises that are so real and I love so much just seem to get hidden in the shadows. So, what did God say to Moses? How did God respond to Moses? Well, look there at verse 12. And he said, Certainly, I will be with you, promise, and this shall be a sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God at this mountain. Promise, isn't that something? What did God say? God said, Moses, I've been with you all this time. Don't you think I can still be with you? Listen, I've been with you in a place that's not even on the map. Don't you think that I can be with you in, the, in, 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 in the, one of the, 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 the highest, most revered and feared centers of world government? But just, just so you'll know, and just so you will recall, even down the road, perhaps, when that fear is going to start sneaking back in, just so you know, listen, Moses, when you bring the people out of Egypt, promise, prophetic promise, you're going to bring them, and you are going to worship me right here, right here. You see, where Moses is, is where Moses will be again. I don't want that to sound just like rhetorical nonsense, but let that sink in just a moment. Where Moses is, is where he will be again when he leads the Hebrews out of their slavery in Egypt. We've already said this, but let me say it again. When God brings us through the wilderness, it is not just for you or me in that moment. God is growing, God is maturing, God is preparing us not only for what is ahead, but he is also preparing us to be a, to be a guide, to be a light of faith for those that are going to come along behind us and around us that are going through a wilderness, perhaps the same wilderness, perhaps a similar wilderness. There are going to be in just a matter of weeks or months or however long it took for all of these plagues to happen. We don't know, and that's not the point. But Moses is going to, before too long, have hundreds of thousands of people around him right there in that same spot, and they're going to be afraid, and they're going to be uncertain, and they're going to be complaining, and Moses is going to be able to say, hey, whenever the date was, I was standing right here, and you know what God told me? He told me that we would be right here again, right here. That's how much God cares. That's how important it is to walk by faith and not be consumed by fear. I can trust God. You can trust God wherever you are. You know that? God was just showing Moses this ahead of time. You know how often we've said God gives us enough 
information for the next step. But every once in a while, he gives us just a little bit more of a view. When we're, God was giving Moses one of those just a little bit more of a preview, kind of like the trailer for a movie. You know, not the whole thing, but just a little clip. You're going to be back here, Moses. And there's going to be a lot of fear and a lot of uncertainty. And you're going to need to remind the people, hey, God's already been here. God knows where this place is because he found me out here. You think he can't see all of us? You think he can't hear all of us? So what do we need to do? We need to trust God wherever we are. But that wasn't Moses' only question. Moses' first question, who am I? Well, he continues because, again, he's, he's wrestling with this now. So his second question goes something like this. Who are you? Who are you? Look at verse 13. Then Moses said to God, Behold, listen, God, I'm going to the sons of Israel, and I will say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. Now they may say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? Moses was not only worried about what Pharaoh would say. You know, he said, hey, who am I to go before Pharaoh? He was worried about what the Israelites would say. He was worried about what the Hebrews would say. Perhaps he was worried that the pain and despair of over 400 years of slavery had, had, had erased the memories of God's covenant with, with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Or perhaps he was concerned that because of the, the pantheistic culture that they were living in where everything had a, every god had a name, and they had now grown up in this for multiple generations, that perhaps they would, would want to know, God, what, what's this God's name? So, so Moses uh, wants to be able to give them, you know, kind of a, a quick and convenient way to, to describe God. Well, there's only one problem with that. The name of God is not quick and it's not convenient. How does he respond? Look at verse 14. God said to Moses, I am who I am. Okay. Let's just dig a little deeper in that. He said, thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Now, we could probably take a whole semester of seminary class and not fully exhaust that verse right there. We're not going to do that. Uh, I'm going to try to uh, speak directly to it here for just a few moments. You know me, I hope well enough to know I like to try to keep it simple because that's the way my mind is is going to function. And as I read this again, a verse that's probably familiar to most, if not all of us, at least this this name that God gives, this Old Testament name that, that, you know, you hear preachers say, you know, well, anytime now in the Old Testament when you see the word Lord all capitalized, this is the name, this is Yahweh, this is Jehovah. This is, this, is, this is where God formally gives us. This is not the, this is not the only time that the people had, had called out to him. You can go back even into Genesis, and, and, uh, and, and by the time Seth was born, uh, the Scripture says they were calling out, uh, they were calling on the name of the Lord. But God had not specifically identified himself as Yahweh, as the, as the I Am until now. And this is what it reminded me of, or this is the way my simple mind tries to get wrapped around it. Do you remember in your English class, your grammar lesson, somewhere along the way, studying the being verbs? Remember the being verbs? You know, you got, you got, you got the action verbs and you got the, got the being verbs. You know, am, is, are, was, were, be, being, and been. Remember those? These verbs are designed to, to basically tell how the subject of a sentence is or how it was or, or how it will be. And God identifies himself as the I am. The the root of this word uh, literally means to be. So when God uses I am as his name, he's reminding Moses, he's reminding Israel, he's reminding us that he was not just God way back then, you know, because he's identified as the God of your father, the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. So it would be easy to say, and, and, and some will even say, you know, well, that, you know, that, that God's, you know, that's, that's, that's old. God back then he was. Or we may say, well, you know, I just, I just want to do, you know, whatever I can do and just try to be good. And, you know, one day I'll get it all uh, you know, settled with God somewhere down the road. You know, I, I will. 
You know, because, you know, before, before I die, God tells Moses, no, I'm, I'm not, my name's not I was, and it's not I will be, but he said, I am. It's, remember we said, it's, it's, it's not easy, it's, it's, it's not convenient, uh, because that means that if he is, I am, that means, yes, he was. It also means he will be. He is God. Here, now, overall. He sees us. He knows where we are. He, he can be right here, right now, where you are, even in the wilderness. God, who, who are you? I am. You are what? I am. Fill in the blank. Fill in the blank. I can trust God wherever I am. But I can also trust who God is wherever I am. I can trust who he is, whatever my circumstances are. We live in a world where, where, where someone comes on the scene and, and, and we see them and we hear them and we watch them and we listen to them and we decide, oh, that's somebody I want to follow. That's somebody I want to be like. And all of a sudden just and something happens and everything goes south. And I realize my trust was misplaced. You place your faith. You can place your trust in the God who is, I am, and I assure you, based on the authority of God's word, it is not misplaced. It is not misplaced. Here, Moses was, was so concerned. He was concerned about what Pharaoh might say he was concerned about what the Israelites might say. He was he was in, even concerned, you know, uh, you know what, what if, if they would even believe him or not. Look at the next question. Look at the next question. We move on down into verse four. I mean, chapter four, verse one. And the next question is a, is a what if? What if they basically don't believe? What if? And this is another question that we wrestle with. We wrestle with our own identity. We wrestle with the identity, with who God is. And then, and then we wrestle with, with, how's everybody else going to respond? What's everybody else going to think? What's everybody else going to say? And this is really where the, 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 the rubber of the wheels of faith meet the road. This is where I'm going to have to make some decisions. Look at verse 1. Of chapter 4, Moses said, what if they will not believe me or listen to what I say? For they may say, the Lord has not appeared to you. What am I going to do then? What am I going to do then? Moses is still hung up, still worried about what others might think or others might say, and, and say instead of who God is and what he's already promised. We sing that song from time to time, and it is so appropriate, standing on the promises of God. That is a firm foundation. How quickly Satan still uses this excuse to keep us silent and to keep us still when God has called us to speak up and he has called us to serve. Let me say that again. How quickly Satan will use this. What if, what if, what if they don't believe? What, if they, what, what are they going to say? How quickly Satan will use this excuse to keep us silent and to keep us still when God has called us to speak up and he has called us to go and to serve. And we get bound up in questions like, what if, what if, what if, my, what if my faith question makes someone feel awkward? talk about, you know, we should, we should share our faith. We should tell others about Jesus. Well, what, if I, what if I start talking about faith and, and that makes somebody feel awkward or embarrassed? And Satan will use that to keep us silent and to keep us still. What if my faith stand makes someone mad? Oh, no, there's a real one. 
What if my stand of faith makes someone mad? Or this one, I don't know which one we wrestle with more. Uh, the, the stand of faith that we're afraid will make someone mad or the step of faith that might just make someone not like us anymore? What if my faith step makes someone not like me anymore? I lose my, I may lose my job. I may, I may lose my friends. I may lose my reputation. Or just like Moses asked, what if I share my faith and they don't believe? What if, what if, what if, what if? So God very graphically reminds Moses what faith looks like. Look at verse 2 and following there in chapter 4. The Lord said to him, what is that in your hand? And he said, a staff. Then he said, throw it on the ground. So he threw it on the ground, and it became a serpent. And Moses, Moses had common sense. He, he ran. He fled from it. Now, we don't know necessarily that it was a poisonous snake, but it, it, it definitely startled Moses. didn't have to be a poisonous snake for me. I'll tell you that. I'd run from it. Verse 4, but the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand and grasp it by its tail. So he stretched out his hand, and he caught it, and it became a staff in his hand. And then God said, so that they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. And he goes on, and not only does he perform a miracle with this inanimate object with a stab, but also with Moses' hand, he tells him to put it into his, into his robe and pull it out, and it's covered in leprosy. He tells him, I right, put it back in. He puts it back in. He brings it out, and it's clean. So not only God says, am I God over, I have power over inanimate objects, I have power over animate objects. And so if, that, if that's not enough for Israel, if that's not enough for Pharaoh, you go scoop some water out of the Nile and pour it on the ground, and it will turn to blood. And that was God's way of saying, I'm bigger than any pagan God. I made that water. I can do what I want to with that water. That water is not a God. That's what faith looks like. Again, no indication here that God's trying to scare Moses or, or anyone else. He was simply trying to show them that he had complete control over everything. And you know what fear does? We've already said it. It makes me forget that God is God. I forget that he is in control so that I can, try, I can trust God wherever I am. I can trust who God is wherever I am. But I can also trust God with whatever I have. I can trust Him. You can trust Him with whatever you have. You can trust Him with whatever you don't have. That's faith. So many questions. So many concerns. But God. But God, but God. And finally, finally, and, and, and just one last desperate attempt to get out of this commission, to get out of this assignment, we, we see Moses literally begging God. I mean, he, he gets polite in verse 10 of chapter 4 and says, Please, Lord, please, Lord. Look at verse 10, chapter 4. Moses said to the Lord, Please, Lord. I've never been eloquent, neither recently nor in times past, nor since you have spoken to your servant, for I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. And then look at verse 13. But he said, please, Lord, now send the message by whomever you will. That's Moses' way of saying, Lord, send somebody else. Send somebody else. You got the wrong guy. You ever thought that? You ever looked at where you were? Maybe the task, that was it? maybe the circumstances, or maybe even in your, in your place of service and ministry. And you thought, God, this, you got the wrong person. This is too much for me. And God's simply saying, yes, exactly. Just like it was too much for Moses. Just like he had to trust in me. So you 
and I, we must trust in this final desperate plea. Again, what's Moses doing? He's highlighting his weakness, his inability. But God, I, but God, I, but God, I, trying to convince God that he's got the wrong man. But you know what I've learned and been told and sometimes been reminded the hard way? God doesn't make mistakes. He doesn't make mistakes. Moses was not a mistake, and you're not a mistake. I'm not a mistake. How did God respond? Look at the verses in between the two that we just read in verse, chapter 4, verse 11 and 12. The Lord said to him, who has made man's mouth? No, he said, he said I'm just, I talk slow, and people can't hear me, and he said, who has made man's mouth, or who makes him mute, or deaf, or seeing, or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now then, go, and I, even I, will be with you. I will be with your mouth, and I will teach you what you are to say. And that's not the only time we hear that promise from God. God made that promise to the prophet Jeremiah. Even Jesus told his disciples that there would be times when they were persecuted, when they would, be, when they would stand before the court. He said, don't worry about what you say because he said, I will tell you at just the right time what you must say. My conversations with God are so often, me, me, me. <laughs> and how does God respond? Well, just like he responded to Moses, he says, I know. He says, I will. And he says, I am. And you know what? That's enough. That's enough. Wherever you are, whatever your circumstance, whatever you have or whatever you don't have, God is enough. And we should live by faith and not by fear. just got to stop and take inventory of a couple of things here. We need to take inventory of the promises, and that's why it's so important to spend that consistent, daily, intentional time in God's Word because you open it up, and again and again and again and again, we read the promises. And now there's another inventory list that we need to make, but after we've made the list, the inventory, after, we've, after we've made inventory of the promises, the second list is just not going to measure up. And that's the, that's the inventory of our excuses, our lame, self-centered, pitiful excuses. And I can assure you that next to the promises of God, they will pale in comparison. And in the end... I must simply ask the question of myself, do I really trust God? Do I really believe that he is able? Because here's what's happening. When I doubt, when you doubt that God can do what he says he's going to do, when I, when I begin to highlight my weaknesses and my frailties, ultimately what I'm saying is, God, you're not big enough. You're not good enough. You're not strong enough. And ultimately what I'm saying is, God, you're not God. And that's just not true. Oh, would we let him be God? Would we trust him whenever, wherever, whatever? That's walking by faith. Father, I thank you today that where Moses was so long ago, we, we can find ourselves very easily in that same wilderness questioning, wondering, making excuses. When you have proven over and over and over again that you are able, that you are faithful, and that you love us, and that you have a, a, an awesome, amazing, miraculous plan and purpose for our lives. But this fear highlights the real problem in our lives, and that's sin. Lord, I pray that you would take us, and just like you did with Moses, that you would 
do whatever it takes to convince us that, that you are able, that, that you're big enough right where we are. And Lord, whether it be to take those first steps of, of faith and trust in you, the excuse may sound something like, well, I, I've just done so much, or, or I've, gotten so, I've gone so far, God can't save me. Oh, oh, what an awful lie that Satan would have us believe. Because you loved us so much that you, you came to us, God in the flesh, to be the perfect payment, the complete, absolutely sufficient payment for our sins. When Jesus died on the cross as our perfect sacrifice. So, Lord, I pray that, that excuses like that would be gone today. And I, and I pray that for those excuses of, well, I'm so busy, or, I'm, or I've just, I, I just don't know what to say, or I, I don't know that I can handle it, or, or what will others think if I just sell, my, if I just sell out to you, God? Oh, would you take all of those excuses and wash them, wash them with the flood of your grace and your mercy and your love today, reminding us that, that your way is always the best way. And it's a way that leads all the way to heaven. And remind us again today, Lord, that there's, there's only one thing we can take with us. And that's someone else. So, Lord, would you open our eyes and open our ears and, and open our hearts to those around us that are perhaps on a similar journey in the wilderness right now. And just as Moses would one day lead the nation of Israel through this same wilderness, so, Lord, would you give us the, the strength and you give us the courage, and, Lord, would you be the, the wisdom and direction that we need to, to do the same. Thank you. Thank you that we can come to that place of surrender, placing our faith completely, totally in you, and be sure that it is never misplaced. Oh, we thank you. We thank you today as we follow you completely, totally today. We worship you as Lord, King of kings. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, it may be that you are somewhere on this journey of faith, perhaps very much at the beginning, maybe still in the wilderness, not really sure of where to go and which way to turn, but, but you hear through God's Word and by the, by the wooing of His Holy Spirit in your mind and in your heart today, you, you know He's speaking to you, and it's, it's time to take those steps of faith and trust and obedience in Him, believing that He is who He said He is, and He will do what He has said he will do because he's already done enough through Jesus Christ. Would love to help you take those first steps of faith in Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, or perhaps to take some next steps of service and surrender and obedience, being a part of his church right here or perhaps right where you are, getting plugged in, allowing God to fill you up through your surrender to him, through your walk with him, and then send you out to serve and to be used for his glory. All of that is a part of this journey. And yes, sometimes it requires that wilderness experience but oh it draws us close to him and reminds us of his faithfulness so wherever you are you can trust God today and I hope you will do that I hope that you will let us help you do that as well but thank you so much for being a part of our worship time today and we hope to see you real soon God bless you we love you so much